Hi guys, welcome to FD200 Trend Forecasting. This week we'll be going over chapter seven. Um, I'll share my screen here and we can go on with our lecture. All right, as usual, this is our book that we're working from. We're working from the fifth edition. <clears throat> this is still part two of the book and it's called Forecasting Influences. Specifically, this chapter is chapter seven and it's all about subcultures. The objectives for this chapter is to differentiate between subculture, counterculture, and street fashion, and the role that dress plays as a communication tool in each category. Also to identify major style tribes and the appearance markers that distinguish each tribe. Okay, so let's uh, define a couple of these terms. Subcultures are young working class people who set themselves apart from a parent culture, through clothing, music, and values. So this is not the same thing as counterculture. It consists that consistently is mainly made up of middle-class young people reacting to the mainstream. So this specifically is young working class people who set themselves apart from the parent culture, from what your parents would like you to be or what you're expected of in society. Um, and they're deeply influenced through clothing, music, and values. Anti-fashion, on the other hand, are clothing that members of subcultures and countercultures wear as an expression of dissent, protest, ridicule, and outrage. So, you know, when these subcultures take part in purchasing garments or uh, wearing specific garments, typically this is clothing that is considered anti-fashion. Um, and this is, you know, to wear as an expression of we're protesting the mainstream or we're protesting what is popular. Oppositional dress is clothing that represents a dissent or distinctive ideas of a group or views hostile to the conformist majority. So this is not specific within a certain group or culture. This is just dressing oppositional to what everyone is wearing. So let's say when everyone was wearing skinny jeans, oppositional dress would be to wear, you know, pants that are extremely wide and disproportionate, like, you know, that raver type pant where um, it was really hard to find and it also was not being seen in the mainstream. Street fashion is not the same as a subculture because street fashion is not a shared dress style associated with a particular lifestyle and is instead a mix of current trends and individual expressions. So the way I just kind of try to discern the two is a subculture is a very niche and cohesive group of people. So let's say like, um, you know, Lolitas or punks or preppy people, right? They wear very specific clothing. Um, and everyone in that group wears very similar garments. When we talk about street fashion, that is not the same as subculture because it's not everyone that wears street fashion doesn't wear the same garments, right? It's not as cliche, it's not as specific, it's not as um, closed off, right? So this is actually more based on individual expression. So every single person in street fashion can be different. Um, and a lot of times it mixes trends that are happening in the moment and then altered significantly based on how that person perceives it and how they want to modify it. This is also characterized by youthful experimentation with the impulse to provoke attention, comment, or reaction. So great places to see street fashion is in New York City, Copenhagen, Japan, um, where it's not necessarily a part of a group, but it's an outward expression of hey, look at me, I wanna provoke um, the mainstream, right? I took what was mainstream, but I made it my own. I'm interesting to look at, I need, I want comments, I want reactions. Um, and a lot of times we take street, street wear, street looks as inspiration as for what is to come in fashion. Street looks are influential for casual street, fair, street wear and directional for other age groups and categories through a process described as the bubble up theory. So we take a lot of inspiration from the ground, which is from the street. And um, we use that to propel what's next in fashion. So if most trend forecasters grab their inspiration or grab their ideas of what's gonna be happening for the next seasons through researching the street, researching what people are wearing um, in street fashion. Style tribes is all about adopting an appearance 
style as a distinction of belonging to a group, a cluster of like-minded people and like living people is a marker of membership in the style tribe. So um, typically they are people that have the similar lifestyles, okay? Or they live similarly, which is very important and different than a lot of you know the other groups like subculture groups. Occupational clusters, groups sharing special interests, cliques with the same taste in fashion and fashion and decor are style tribes. People in technological or creative fields often develop an unofficial uniform look. So when we talk about like Silicon Valley or like the Amazon you know, techies, that techie look, we instantly think of, or at least I instantly think of like khakis, a pair of runners, um, maybe a Patagonia or a vest, zip up vest, right? That has kind of become an, an identifiable staple of a finance or a tech worker um, where they're comfortable. They're still, you know, kind of professional, but ultimately it's casual because they're sitting in front of a, com a computer and they don't really care what they look like. Influential style tribes. So the rise in the economic and cultural power of the teenager in the years after World War II led to the evolution of many noteworthy style tribes. One of the most important is the Teddy Boys or the Teds. Okay, this is from Britain. It's the first significant style tribe that was noted um, in the post-World War II era. This group was uh, a a group of working class young men who in the early 1952 started dressing up in an, Ed, in an upper class Edwardian style um, and high quiff hairstyles that were held play, in place in bright claim. So the Teddy Boys impact on the mainstream fashion was minimal because it didn't really necessarily catch on to the mainstream and what designers started doing in that time, but it was impactful enough to be noted as the first style tribe um, considered the first style tribe after World War II. Okay, so we're going to go into specific subcultures. Um, and the first one is Chola. So for your homework assignment, you'll have to choose one of these from the book and do a little more research on them. Um, so Cholo, Chola, I think we're all very aware of this subculture just because we live in Southern California. Um, we take a lot of inspiration from this group, but Cholas, as the book describes, um, frequently wear baggy dickies, denim or khaki pants, t-shirts or tank tops, flannel shirts, cat eye sunglasses, and flat black shoes. Cholas typically wear heavy makeup, including dark eyeliner, lighter lipstick, thin eyebrows, long teased hair. And as you see here on the runway for Givenchy's fall winter 2015 collection, it was described as a Chola Victorian. So it's really important to start noticing what these subcultures bring to the table and how the fashion industry kind of takes from them and uses them as inspiration for um, future trends. So that's why we research subcultures so much because they are a constant source of inspiration. And as we go through the years, we get more and more subcultures that we can take from, you know, or adapt from. Not always, it's not always the most, you know, not always done in the most respectful way, I will say, but we do as a whole, the industry take from these subcultures because they're so individual and they're so special. Second is the goth. Okay, so it's a post-punk movement that is fascinated by ideas of darkness, death, the supernatural, inspired specifically by the Victorian era. The goths typically use pale makeup, heavy eye makeup, black or blood red lips, dyed black hair, black nail polish, and crucifixes or other symbols of religion or the occult or common accessories. <clears throat> High number of variations include cyber goth, health goth, and mall goth. Now, I know for a fact there is a bunch of other type of goths, especially in 2022, but for this project, for your homework, you'll specifically focus on just the generalized idea of goth. Grunge. This originated in Seattle in the late 1980s. In the late 1980s. Um, they had a distinctive look inspired by the climate of Seattle, where flannel shirts were utilitarian and popular. Anti-consumerist ethos encouraged thrift store shopping, uh, recycling, wearing old clothes or tattered jeans and cargo shorts, faded and torn t-shirts, oversized sweaters and cardigans, and specifically Doc Martin boots, which are still very popular in Seattle today. Um, a woman who also, a woman also wore fitted ringer t-shirts, ribbed collars and cuffs and contrasting colors from the body of the t-shirt fabric, vintage floral or baby doll dresses, and nightgowns as slips or dresses. So kind of think, 
Nirvana, Nirvana and Courtney Love in that era. That was kind of that grunge era in Seattle. Hip hop, this is the most dynamic and constantly changing style tribe or subculture. Um, sneakers are the heart of hip hop fashion. We have definitely taken that from this culture um, or style tribe. Uh, we specifically have used sneakers as part of a mainstream trend in fashion. Uh, we pair sneakers now with everything, right? Before we wouldn't wear sneakers with a, a dress. And now that is totally acceptable because we've taken that inspiration from this group. Early hip hop fashion favored a loose silhouette, okay? Items from sportswear and workwear clothing, bold color and oversized jewelry. Formative hip hop dress was functional in nature. Uh, accessories include a lot of gold jewelry, Kangol haps and oversized sunglasses or eyeglasses. Um, and then Marc Jacobs and fall winter 2017 was billed as a tribute to 1970s New York and the origins of hip hop. Lolita and Japanese culture. Lolita represents cuteness, sweetness, elegance, and above all, modesty. Uh, it's based on British children's clothing from the Victorian and Edwardian area with some Rococo influences. Two Lolita style icons are Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland character and Marie Antoinette. Lolita is now an umbrella term for a style of dress that has several sub subcategories beneath it. So sweet Lolita is more like ch childlike. Gothic Lolita is dressed like they're attending a Victorian funeral. A punk Lolita looks like she's from the 1970s British street culture. Sailor Lolita takes its cue from the naval uniform. The Japanese Lolita is based on traditional Japanese dress. Classic Lolita is the original tradi traditional Lolita look. Ouija are women who dress in Victorian young boys dress. Japanese men who dress in adult Victorian era dresses are known as dandies. Mods. Okay, these are founded in London and Southern England at the end of 1950s. They were influenced by styles coming from the European continent and mods were fans of Jamaica, Jamaican ska and American soul and R&B music. Mod style was based on looking stylish and perfectly groomed at all times. And attention to detail was very, very important for this group. Punks, they were founded in London in the mid 1970s quickly spread to New York and other major cities. Punk was more than just a music scene. It was also a progressive and political and philosophical, philosophical movement. So this is really important to point out that not only was the inspiration for punks taken from music, but it started to trickle in and mix with political um, ideas and notions. Punk style is one of the best examples of oppositional dress with its goal of shocking and offending polite society. It's based on the idea that anyone can DIY, do it yourself. So you can add safety pins to things, you can rip things, you can bleach things. Um, it's a very big DIY based type of dress. The original British punk movement did not last long, but its impact on fashion remains strong. High fashion still regularly references punk. You see punk in every single runway show. Steampunk imagines, imagines an alternative science fiction based world set in the 19th century that merges styles from the Victorian and Edwardian era with ideas about futuristic technology. This incorporates a Wild West aesthetics, aesthetic, so there's kind of a rustic vibe to this, um, but also a regal vibe and also a futuristic vibe. So it kind of incorporates a lot of the cultures put in one. Um, and the Wild West aesthetic was in part because a, literally, a literary movement was founded at the same time in the Western United States. Okay, let's talk about the future of subcultures. So new style tribes are always emerging. Okay, we know that for a fact. Um, frequently as evolution of a look from established tribe, but with the styles that appeal to modern young people. So when I was going to high school, the emo look of the mid 2000s, that was huge. Or the scene kids, you know, in my high school, there was emo scene kids. Um, and that became popular in the late 2000s. The modern style tribe that has attracted most media attention recently are hipsters. Um, so constantly as we proceed and progress, we are coming up with new style subcultures. Young people will always seek to both stand out from mainstream society while fitting in with others that they feel are like themselves. That's kind of part of nature. Um, I think this is a, extremely prevalent in high school when you're trying to find your people or your group, and then you guys all kind of start dressing similarly, which is important, because, which is funny to point out because 
you're trying to be different, but then you find people that are similar to you and then you kind of start becoming a group where you all look very consistent and cohesive. So, um, but it's part of finding yourselves and finding, you know, the people that you resonate with. Um, and this is, you know, very important when we do this through dress. All right, that's chapter seven. So make sure you read the chapter in the book and look over the notes. Thank you guys.